morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be here in this lovely morning. We welcome you to our service here this morning and a very warm welcome to everyone who joins us here in our church and also a warm welcome if you join later online. You're all very welcome. We also welcome this morning and can I introduce Aaron Anderson who will lead our service and Zara. Announcements. We all have order of service and can I ask, can I draw your attention to the food bank. The food bank is always very grateful and is always very needful of whatever donations we can give. So anything that that's always given with many thanks. Uh, we also have the, the givings to date, but also say that Philip is back from tomorrow, so he will be leading our services from Sunday next. You're also very welcome to stay for tea, coffee, and a chat after the service. Can I say thanks, Alison, for leading our praise. Thank you, Barton, for doing the recording, and Trevor for later uploading the service to the internet. Also, thank you to Amanda and Riona for doing tea and coffee. Thank you, Arne for leading our service, and we look forward to hearing from you. And maybe ask you now, Aaron, if you could tell us a bit about your work in Ballyclare. We have a few people here this morning who know where Ballyclare is, so they'll be very, very happy to hear if you can give us a few words about your, your work. Yep. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me this morning. It's wonderful to be here. So I am not a minister, believe it or not. Um, I am a youth pastor and a youth worker for Ballyclare Presbyterian Church. So I look after the, from the ages of two all the way up to the ages of 25. And that can look Sunday school, our youth fellowship, youth discipleship, all of them different types of programs and our outreach programs. So this coming week, we have a massive outreach project called Spark in Newton Abbey. So we'll be having potentially around 250 young people meeting just to go out and serve the communities. In Ballyclare, we have 64, which is incredible. So I sort of head up and look after all of that running within Ballyclare Presbyterian Church. Great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Trevor. Lovely people to start, Aaron. Lord God, we thank you that we can all meet here together as friends to worship and to praise you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Be with Arne as he leads our service and guide and be with him in all the work that he does with the young people in Ballyclare. Help us, O oh Lord, this morning to hear and listen to your word through Arne. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Arne. Oh, so again, very good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Um, this morning, just before we come to sing our first song, just want you to think just around that idea of giving it over to the Lord. There's going to be a lot of that theme throughout today's service. It's just about giving over to Him, letting Him take control and letting Him be the, the guide in each of our lives. To do that, I'm going to read from Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. And this is what it says. Come to me, all you are, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This morning, no matter where you come from, what your circumstances are, we do come into the house of the Lord to worship him. We come to give him the praise for all that we do. And I want you to read this short wee bit of a lyric which I was listening to during the week and it stuck with me a wee bit. The song is called Come As You Are. And that's my call for each of us, Come As We Are. And it says this, it says, Come out of sadness wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner come kneel. So lay down your hurt and lay down your heart. Come as you are. 
This morning, we do that. We come as we are. We don't come as individuals with masks to put up and show how brilliant we are. We come as we are, wherever we are in life this morning. So let us stand and sing, crown him with many crowns. Our reading this morning is found in Genesis chapter 44, going from verses 18 to 34. This is the word of the Lord. Then Judah went up to him and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you're equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asks, asked his servants, do you have a father or brother? And we answered, we have an aged father, and there is a young man, a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only, only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for my, myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. 
when we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our younger brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said this, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went, went away from me. And I said, he, surely be, he has surely been torn to pieces. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. Now, so, so now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy is not there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all of my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come to my, onto my father. Amen. Let us stand again and sing King of Kings. Let me pray. Lord, thank you this morning that we can come before you and sing your praises to you. This morning, from wherever we are coming from, whatever circumstances in life, whether it be joy or sorrow, that we will come and worship you still and worship you the same because you're always there. Lord, each of us know here this morning that all we can do is buy. We deserve none of it, but yet you give it all, and we thank you for that. 
We thank you this morning for all of those who are close to us, our family, our friends. And I pray that each of us here, as we know our friends, that you can, we can pray individually for those who are going through a tough time at the moment, whether it be in sickness or grief or just general worries and stresses of life. And I pray that we, each of us can bring that before you now. Lord, I want to pray also just for our communities at the moment as they're stirred up and wound up that you'll just give wisdom and bring peace into our communities and all that's happening. Give the right people the wisdom and the guidance just to, to pull us through all these times of turbulence and, and pain and suffering. I pray that for this community here at Rosemary that that will be, that will be felt in your peace and mercy and grace will be felt from here. I pray for each member of the congregation here that they will be that light and that beacon that you use in your communities. In whatever way that be, big or small, that each of them will know your presence and, your, and go with the strength and boldness that only you can provide us. In all of these things we pray. Amen. Let us stand again and sing, Be Still. Before we dig into God's word, let me pray. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for each one of us here. I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to hear your good news and to be filled with just that urge to go out and share it more and share it with everyone we can. I pray that 
whatever comes from today that will impact each of us here, will challenge us, will encourage and inspire and give us a sense of peace that our hope is only in you. In this we pray. Amen. This morning, I read from a part half of chapter 44. We're going to take a wee bit of a trip this morning um, through the story of Joseph and subsequently what comes out of that for Judah, his other brother. But this morning, if I was to say to you what comes to mind when I say rescue, now my mind goes to a hundred million things. We are constantly bombarded on our TV, rescue stories, stories of rescuing people, animals. A lot of the stories we tell kids can even be as simple as rescuing a cat out of a tree. But it's that idea of rescue which brings us hope and inspires us and it brings us something that we can really cling to and have faith in. When I was thinking about this idea of rescue, a few things popped up in my mind. Firefighters being one of them. We have saw a bit of that in the news recently, which has not been a good thing, but they are there rescuing, whether it be properties, people. They are there rescuing people. Search and rescue. In the area we are in, very near to Cave Hill, that sometimes is quite a sad sight to see the helicopter looking for people. Says, but they do that job and they go out attempting and seeking to rescue. Here's another one. Doctors. I think at some stage in our lives we have been treated by a doctor. I've been treated by a few for injuries I've had to myself. They rescue you. They do. They really do. And it can be in small ways or massive ways. But they are rescuers in a way. And my question is today... When somebody says rescue, does this come into mind? Does Christ come into mind? Sadly, sometimes that's not the first thing we think of when we think of rescue. When I was doing this prep, that was, I challenged myself to think. And it was only when I took a step back and looked at all the other types of rescuers did I realize Christ is a massive rescuer. He is our main rescuer. And he is the the rescuer in the story of Joseph. And in many ways, two people are rescued. Two people in the story of Joseph are rescued. And it's God who rescues them. And it points to how Christ is our rescuer. So let's take a look at this then. We have Joseph, the first character in the story who is rescued and he's rescued in about a hundred million different ways throughout the entire story. God constantly rescues him. In the beginning he was the beloved son. He was the son of Jacob and he was loved and he was favored highly above all of his brothers. He was the one who gained favor. He was treated with ridiculous amounts of respect. He was given a a lavish gift which his brothers were jealous of. And that's the point where we see the first rescue. He was sold into slavery. God's hand moved in that story. He moved to put Joseph in the right place. He rescued him from the pit and moved him into slavery, which I know doesn't sound like a massive, massive rescue, but as it works out, it was. It was enormous. God rescues him in other ways. And later on in the story, with Potiphar's wife, God holds him fast. Joseph shows that he believes in something more than himself. He showed himself to be steadfast in his own moralities. And what does God do? When he is thrown in prison, God yet again rescues him. He gives an opportunity for Joseph to be used by God to impact where he is. When in a cell, he he goes from a prisoner to a prince. Now, if that isn't rescue, I don't know what is, because I've never been a prisoner and I've never been a prince, but that jump for me is enormous. It's huge. 
And many of us here probably can't even work out what that might have felt like to be in a jail cell one day, to advising the most powerful man in the world the next. It probably wouldn't happen today. But here, God rescues Joseph and uses Joseph to impact where he is. And why does God do that? The last thing he does, he rescues his brothers. In chapter 45, he rescues his brothers. He then becomes not the rescuee, but the one who does the rescue. It's an incredible story of rescue. And in many ways, when looking at this story in Joseph, the parallels between Joseph and Jesus are very in your face. When we look at Joseph, he was given a vision. He was given a message to bring. What was the first instinct to do? It wasn't to listen to the message. It was to kill the rescuer. It was to kill the messenger. Does that sound familiar? So for some of that's when we look at Jesus' life, he brought a message. What did we do? They killed him. They didn't listen. They didn't welcome him as his own. Joseph's in the same boat here. And what's incredible about Joseph is that he knows this. Later in chapter 46, 47, 48, we hear about his sons. And you're going to have to forgive me because my Hebrew is not very good. I am hopeless at Hebrew, but I did have to look these up. His, one of his sons is called Manasseh. That's an incredible name. Do you know what it means? It means to pull something up and turf it away. We do that with weeds in our garden. Weeds are not good. They destroy things. We pull them up, and we don't really treat them with much respect because they go straight into the brown bin. That's what it means. And for Joseph and his brothers, that's forgiveness. He took everything that his brothers did unto him and thought, you know what? That's gone. That's forgotten. I've pulled that up and it's gone. It's no longer there. So all of the things that he suffered in his time in slavery is gone. And he knows this because of the name he gives his son, Manasseh, to pull up and to forget about him. His second son, or the other son, is Ephraim. I probably said that wrong, so you're going to have to forgive me. But it means to be prospered in the land of your affliction. Or in Joseph's word, land of his affliction. In many ways, when we look at the story, we see all the incredible things Joseph gets in the end. He endures it all, and he gets power, and he gets wealth. He has a wife, he has a family. He's loved by all the people, by an entire nation. He's the right hand man to the most powerful man in the world. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So, why on earth would you name your son? God prospered me in the land of my affliction. Because Joseph wasn't living for that. This is the thing, and this is what makes this story so incredible is that Joseph's purpose was with God's people. When he's in Egypt, he's not with God's people. He, if we go back to what he has, he has pagan power. He has pagan wealth. He has a pagan wife. A, a, na- a pagan nation love him. And you think, well, that's the world. That's like us today, where we look at it and go, well, the world loves you. Your company loves you. Your businesses love you. You're really popular on social media. That's the equivalent of what Joseph was in. He was in the height of popularity. He had everything, but yet he knows he had nothing of worth. He knows he has absolutely nothing of worth because he wasn't with God's people. He wasn't with God's promised people. And he wasn't with God's promised people in their promised land. He was pushed aside. He was separate. He was separated. And he knows this. But yet God still prospers him in the land of his affliction. And the ultimate thing that 
prospers him is this. And it brings it on to his brother. Who's the story actually about? The story of Joseph. There, Joseph is the main character, but it's certainly not about Levi. It's not about Reuben. And it's not about Simeon. And it's not about Benjamin. It's about Judah. And this is the incredible thing. In this story, Judah has one chapter. That's it. It's chapter 38. And it is the worst moment in his life. It was the chapter about Judah and Tamar. And it's a gut-wrenching story. So after today, if you want to go and read that back, please do, because it puts this all in perspective. But it's horrible. He is the lowest of the low. He, is the, he feels the worst of the worst. He's completely failed. Rubber stamped, mailed, he's failed. It's like that awful feeling when you come home from a test or from work and you haven't had a target and you get a big mark saying, yeah, you failed. I had a few marks of them when I was at school. A big D written on it in red letters. But, so we know what that feels like, but to fail is not a nice thing. To fail is awful. Judah fails. However, knowing this actually puts it makes it even more important. The story of Joseph and him being rescued and put into the position he's in is the only way Judah can fix that failure. It's the only way Judah can be redeemed throughout his life. It's always a nice knowing the story. There's, there's a moment where it can all change and we see that. We see that because Judah was God's chosen. For him, there was a line that leads right to Jesus, and we'll get to that a bit later on. He was the one who was chosen. But he couldn't take up that mantle because he had failed. So what does he do? In the story we've just read in Genesis chapter 44, he's redeemed. He's redeemed because of what he does. In the end, when in that story, it's the story of the silver in the sack, and only Benjamin has the silver cup in his sack. And Judah said, or Joseph says, I'm going to take him, and he's going to stay with me. The very thing that Judah was told not to let happen is now happening. Worst nightmare type feeling. He's going, oh no, I can't go home anymore. If Benjamin stays here, I can't go home. The hurt all it cause. So what does he do? He goes to Joseph and pleads with him. And in the end, he says, keep me in place of my brother. Why? So that he may be redeemed and my father will be pleased. And he won't, his gray head will not go down to the grave in sorrow and misery, but be lifted up in praise. This summer has been filled with sport. It's been filled with sport. And in sport, there are substitutes. This idea of being substituted or going in place of someone else is really, really important. It's immensely important. In this story, Judah is the ultimate substitute here. In this story. Does that sound familiar in, in some ways? What's been done? So what on earth does this mean for us? What does it mean and why is it so important that this all happens? Okay, so you're going to have to bear with me. There's, we're going to take a wee bit of a, it's going to be a quick road trip through the Bible. All right? This is so important because way back in Genesis chapter 3, there's a promise made and it's a promise made against the serpent. And that promise is that there will be a promised seed who will destroy it. That's why in Genesis 4 you have the first murder. So the seed of the serpent kills the seed of the woman to stop that prophecy from happening because it was, Satan believed every word of it. 
He knew this would happen. So what do you do? You try and stop it. Stop it before it gets started. We know it doesn't work. Genesis chapter 5, we see the redemption of that line through Seth. And from Seth to Noah, you have 10 generations where this promised line goes. The whole way to Noah. What does God do for Noah? He rescues Noah from the flood. So there's a story of rescue here and it's going to come up even more and more and more and more as we go through this. Noah is rescued. His family are rescued so that this line that will lead to the ultimate rescuer can keep going. From Noah, you would get all the way down to a man named Terah, who his son Abraham has, he's told that he will have a son. And that son will be the one, but does he believe it? No. He says, I know better. Hagar. Now, he's not wrong. Ishmael was the seed of Hagar, but it wasn't the promised one. And that's Isaac. And from Isaac, we get the Jacob. Jacob is then told the same. He needs to take up that mantle to carry that line forward. So he goes to Laban, goes, finds the one he loves completely. I think that's perfect. She is the one. What's almost quite sad and funny about that story is that she can't have children. She can't do it. So how on earth is this line going to go? Till way later in the story, she gave birth to Benjamin and Joseph and died. In the meantime, her sister gave birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. God's plan is incredible. Because Joseph is not the one who is chosen to be that promised one to carry it on. It's Judah. So what does God do? In this story, he rescues two people. He rescues Joseph in order to give Judah the opportunity to rescue, for Judah to be redeemed. From Judah then, that amazing story of being the substitute. Many, many years later, you have a great, 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 great grandson. I don't know how many greats there is in there. It's David. It's King David. What does he do? When he's identified by, he goes into a valley and beats a giant. Not because he wants to, and not because it's his own personal glory. He does it on behalf of his people. He goes again as a substitute to fight on behalf of his people. That's incredible, isn't it? And when we go, when we open the New Testament, the very first page, you have a genealogy in Matthew 1 that just screams from Genesis chapter 3 when the promise was made to now, God has rescued it all. This plan of rescue and redemption is still there. It's still going and it's almost ready. From David, you get a greater son and a greater king in Christ in that line. Um, So what does Christ do? It's incredible because from Judah, from Joseph to Judah to David, the the pattern's the same. It's a substitute. What does Christ do? On behalf of all of God's people, he substitutes his life for ours. He takes the punishment that we should take on our behalf. That message is nothing short of mind-blowing. It's inspirational, knowing that what God can do from the very beginning of time to Christ till now, God is still working. He still moves in the hearts of each one of us. Even though sometimes it doesn't look like it, it moves in the heart of the communities we live in. And this story is to made to 
push us to go and share this because this message is too good to keep for yourself. So why is it so important? Because when you break it down, God rescues Joseph in order to rescue Judah, in order to rescue Israel, in order to rescue me and you. That's a message which is nothing short of mind-blowing and humbling as well, knowing that God will do anything to protect us and to give us redemption and salvation. This morning, I want that to be the joy that you leave here with today. I want it to be the joy that you walk out of this building, knowing that you're held by a God who worked through all of human history to give us what we need most, and that's to be saved from God. And for us today, in 2024, in a time that is immensely choppy and turbulent, that's a message this world needs. And that's a message we are in a position to give. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that you show each one of us, even though we don't deserve it. Thank you that you work in ways that we can't even comprehend this, to see us become more like you. I pray for each one of us here today that this message will be a message of hope and inspiration and joy and confidence. Give each one of us the confidence and the boldness to go out this coming week, month, year, wherever that may be, in work, in school, in, with our friends, in coffee shops, wherever it takes us, that that message of what you've done and the saving grace that you have to give will be given to everyone who walks in and out of this church who walks down the road beside us, who walks anywhere in Belfast, they will know that grace and they will know your peace. I pray for each one of us today as we leave here. I pray for safety. I pray for just joy of what you have done again. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let us stand and sing in Christ alone.
So this morning, whenever we leave here, go with that message. Go with that certainty that there is no guilt in life and no fear in death, because this is the power of Christ in me. Let me pray. Lord, thank you that we can go out of here today knowing with joy and hope and with complete conviction that you are here for us and you live within each one of us and you empower us to go and share your good news of what you did for us. And with that, now may grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and go with you now and forevermore. Amen.